And hey there, everybody. Welcome to Speaker Pro Blab. I'm super excited about this particular show because this addresses my very love, and my love is writing. And I have with me two amazing people, one of which I've had the opportunity to meet last year in Rhode Island, um, Lisa Tenner. Lisa is a Stevie Award-winning book coach. She specializes in helping professionals, experts, enlightened entrepreneurs, I love that, and others to write and publish compelling how-to books, self-help books or memoirs. And her clients have signed five and six figure publishing deals with top New York publishers. Many of her clients self and traditionally published, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, self and traditional publishing, have won prestigious awards for their books. And she also teaches on the faculty of Harvard Medical School's leadership and publishing course and blogs for the Huffington Post. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. She blogs for the Huffington Post on writing and publishing. So um, Lisa Tenner, type in your email, please, so that, hey, Anthony, welcome, and you're very welcome. Okay, where do I type? I'm the sending a message. The bottom right, send a message, yeah, yeah. So um, welcome to everybody. And everybody that's in here, please share this on Facebook or Twitter, and we can bring some more people in to share this knowledge. Down below, we have Howard Van Ness. And Howard, you don't know this, but it was one of your blogs that inspired me to write an ebook. but we'll get to that. Um, Howard Van Ness is, and I got that blog through Lisa's email because I'm on the, uh, right. Lisa's email list. So Howard is president of Let's Write Books Incorporated, a company specializing in work with independent authors, providing publishing and book marketing services. And in addition to being a Kindle marketing expert, I love that, he has over 25 years of writing experience in every format imaginable, including 22 books of his own. I thought I was cool because I had three. 22 books of his own, and many have been number one in their respective categories on Amazon. He's overhauling his website right now, but if you want to get in touch with Howard, Howard, go ahead and put your email address in the comments. And lastly, I am Jolene Moody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Speaker Pro. I'm a professional speaker, author, and coach, and when I'm not on stage speaking, I'm off stage teaching entrepreneurs like you how to find and create paid opportunities and how to expertly close clients from those rooms that you speak in with integrity so that you uh, work less and earn more. So let's dig in. We're talking authorship. So the sound of that word for some, I know for me it's true, it, it rolls off my lips and it's beautiful because for me authorship is a dream come true. I knew I wanted to be a writer since I was this high. You know, I was always writing. I, I tried to submit to a magazine when I was 17 and I submitted longhand because I didn't know any better. But things have changed a lot, you know, since we were younger and, and since um, authorship has really, really grown in dimensions. Today, we have the option to self-publish and many of us do. I know that I did. Um, but many of us would prefer to publish traditionally. So on this segment of Speaker Pro, I want to sort out the pros and cons of each so that our listeners can decide for themselves which route to take and which serves them best. So Lisa, let's start with you. Sure. First, define for us what the basic difference is, and I realize it's not black and white, but the basic difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing. Okay, so traditional publishing means that somebody else publishes the book and you don't pay them to do that, right? And, and generally they would pay you, they would give you an advance for, um, for publishing, uh, for writing the book. And, you know, for a new author, those advances can be very small nowadays, like 500, 1,000, 1,500, um, up to maybe 15 or 20,000. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I do have some authors who've gotten um, higher five figures and even six figure advances. So if you've got a big enough platform or the book just seems super marketable, uh, sometimes then it, it can, you know, you can also attract a traditional publisher. And um, that publisher will do the design, they'll do the editing, and they also have control. They control the, um, they, they control the title of the book. That's not, you don't have the final say in that. They control the cover. So you give over a fair amount of control when you do that. But one thing they're good at is distribution. And, um, and so, you know, there are things that you're sort of, and the cachet maybe, so there are things that you're sort of getting with that. Uh, self-publishing, you have control, you hire the editor, the book designer, um, often somebody to help you market that book, and 
Uh, and then you figure out how are you going to distribute that book, you know, and maybe it's through Amazon, but how are you going to, you know, and, and through CreateSpace, but how are you going to distribute that book and get into the hands of people? So, um, so there, there are two very different paths. On the other hand, there, there are these publishers who call themselves hybrid publishers. And I think I'll just say, you know, if you're thinking about somebody who calls themselves a hybrid publisher or an entrepreneurial publisher, look online for reviews and really read carefully because it's a lot more like self-publishing, but you pay extra. Howard, you're yeah. nodding. Expand on that. What is hybrid <laughs> publishing? Why are you so excited about it? <laughs> well, first of all, I agree with everything that uh, Lisa just said. And um, you know, many years ago, there was a term called vanity uh, publishing, and this was a type of publishing for people who couldn't get the book uh, traditionally published or didn't want to for one form or another, or for one reason or another, I should say. And um, those vanity publishers have kind of uh, morphed into something called hybrid publishers. Not all hybrid publishers are bad, but we have to be careful because often there's exorbitant fees involved, and you may be giving up a lot of control, a lot of your rights. Um, one of the beautiful things about self-publishing is, is that you maintain the control, you maintain the rights, and you have a lot of flexibility um, and opportunity within that. And the minute you give up your rights to an organization or a publisher, then a lot of your opportunity becomes limited. So it could create possibility and opportunity, but it could also limit it. So as Lisa said, you really want to read your contract carefully and be very wary of some hybrid publishers. Let's back up a little bit, because I know when you talk about traditional publishing, for me personally, I said in the beginning, I have always wanted to be published. And to have Random House ring my doorbell and hand me a contract, I think I'd faint on the floor. Um, <laughs> what, what should we expect as potential authors when we seek out an agent number one, um, when it comes to an actual publishing house saying, hey, we really dig this? So, um, so first of all, generally, if you're going to look for a larger publisher, that's when you get an agent. And, it, and you know, if we're talking a smaller platform, smaller publisher, often you would just query the publisher on your own. Um, but the, the agent is going to, they're going to decide, you know, who to send the, the um, proposal out to. Um, obviously with some input from you if you have input and they really know the acquisitions editor as well so they're going to have their favorites they're going to know who might be a really good match for your book and who puts in the extra you know like oh I love this person because she really makes sure the marketing happens or that they, they might know things that are you know real nuances that could help you get a really great match so your agent is going to bring so much to the table and um, I have a blog post actually, I can look it up later and maybe put it on your Facebook page about you know how to choose an agent and questions to ask your agent because there's lots to know when it comes to an agent. So let me write myself a note. And because yeah. um, that would be it, my next question is what where does where do you get an agent? I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that have great stories, great ideas. Those could probably use work. Where mm -hmm. do you find these agents? So uh, you know, there's some good uh, there's some good websites that can help you um, look for a good agent, and um, and also Writer's Digest has a guide to literary agents. Oh. Um, Jeff Herman has a guide, and you know basically also look at books in your category, and they'll generally the author and their acknowledgments will acknowledge their agents. So that's a good way also. And one of the best ways is to go to writers' conferences. So Harvard Medical School's Leadership and Publishing course is a great place to meet agents who are interested in health books and, and self-help book and medical type books. Um, the International Women Writers Guild has a great meet the authors, meet the agents twice a year. It's iwwg.org. And oh, I can type these things in, right? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Org. Um, and um, I think, you know, it's not Harvard Writers anymore, but Harvard Med School Publishing Course. You can just Google that. Um, those are two places I love to go. The San Francisco Writers Conference, uh, sfwc.org. So we need um, to drop into these conferences. We need to look around. We need to ask questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, meeting agents is really powerful and, and hearing what they have to say about what they're looking for. Because if I've heard an agent speak, first of all, I can get a sense if they're really a good match for me. 
And, um, and then, you know, also to really know exactly what they're looking for. Uh, but you also get their energy, you get, I think, a sense of the chemistry too, as you meet them in person and hear them in person. Howard, you want to add anything? What are you, what's your take on agents? What can you share with us? Well, I, I, you know, most of my life is about independent publishing. Yeah. And I, can, I came to, I came to that from not finding an agent mm -hmm. from when I first wrote my first book back in 2002. And, um, you know, I believed I had a really good book and I sent it out, uh, sent a query, a well-crafted query, uh, query and, uh, uh, well-crafted book proposal. It took me three months to write. It was almost like writing the book <laughs> itself. And I sent that out, you know, and I got compliments on my book proposal, but no bites, you know, that were meaningful to me. And um, so I decided at that point to, to move towards independent publishing. But um, I will say that, you know, uh, as Lisa pointed out, you want to know what the agents want and you want to put together a well-crafted query letter and make sure that you're, you're, you're a match that they're going to help you get published and that, that um, they're going to meet your needs as well. So um, I really don't have too much more to add to that. Well, except, let me, uh, let know, me pick up based on what you say, because um, there are so many people today that want to take the route of independent publishing. I did personally because it gave me a tool. When I was in room speaking, I had a table and there was my book. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that was a challenge for me certainly was marketing my own book. So where, you know, help me understand when, when it comes to marketing your own book, well, let me back up and ask the question. You had said that you didn't find that agent that was able to help you publish. Are you satisfied with the fact that you're an independent publisher and what are the pros of it? Yeah. Well, you've asked quite a few I know, questions. I can't there. help myself. <laughs> <laughs> and one of one of the you know one of the great big fallacies is that oh I'm going to get a book deal and then I'm going to make a lot yeah. of money become famous and my book is going to is going to become a bestseller overnight <laughs> and, you know it's just just not going to happen for most people you know you, you need to have uh, a really big um, platform you know you need to have uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of followers uh, followers followers hard for me yeah. to say at the moment followers and you also need to um, uh, have some kind of plan in place and publishers will do a little bit of marketing yeah. for you, but they're not going to traditional publishers will do a little bit of marketing, but they're not going to do a lot of marketing in most cases. So most books don't go on to sell, you know, hundred thousand copies. Most books will sell under 5,000 copies and maybe 10% of books will sell more than 5,000 copies. So um, there's a certain economics involved here and, and you have to think about that and the publisher has to think about it which makes it kind of hard for a publisher to take on any book and that's part of the equation so i, I guess i'm going uh, i guess i got far afield of your your all question yeah, okay, that's good. all good let me let me bounce off that and throw back up to lisa when we talk about traditional publishing and marketing um i have I'm a former journalist and a fellow former journalist wrote a book and Random House offered her a contract. She chose not to take advantage of that contract despite what they were going to give her because she was responsible for all of the marketing. When did that change in the publishing industry that the agent or I'm sorry, the publishing house wasn't going to take on a bigger bulk of that marketing and it was more the author's responsibility? You know, um, there's not a specific time frame. I'd say yeah. that it's been moving in that direction um, for the past decade, I would say. And, you know, there's still, I know, like with this book, the publisher, um, what did they do? They did put the author on a speaker's bureau and, and they got a few really nice speaking gigs, like even with, I think it might have even been The New Yorker. They got some great speaking gigs um, through their publisher. Um, I, I I think this publisher did uh, now I'm not sure if it was his own publicist or the publisher got him in New York Times um, front page of I think it was the living section so you know publishers are still doing some but I would say don't expect anything you know generally you're going to be doing almost all of it and if you get anything that's like icing on the cake um, so yeah there's not a specific date and still sometimes they do things but don't count on it and also, you know, sometimes the publisher will do a few things at the beginning, and if they just see book sales are not, you know, the books aren't jumping off the shelves, they'll drop it. And so it may be like, oh, they're saying they're going to do all these things, and then it's like they do a couple, book sales don't jump off, and then it's like, okay, sorry. And all of a sudden, the author's left with, what? You said you were going to do all these great things, and that author may need to hire a publicist if they want to keep getting attention for the book. So... 
Um, it is tricky. And again, one reason you may want to be talking to Howard and really looking at self-publishing because you control so much more when you self-publish. Mm -hmm. um, and you know th there are real advantages and disadvantages to both. But I, I actually, when I when I was turning around before, I was grabbing a few books, and you know there is a good example of an author who self-published. And um, hold that right up to your yeah, webcam. Three thousand pulses later, and um, she, she, Martha Rhodes, um, you know it's it's a memoir about surviving depression using this incredible fairly new technology called TMS, transmagnetic cranial stimulation, and it works yeah. with magnets. And um, it's a fascinating memoir. And she was written up in the New York Times, um, she and Saturday Evening Post, and got a bunch of fantastic, um, uh, fant fantastic press, and also, you know, many thousands of books. I think the last I heard was maybe five or six thousand. I think it's more now. And um, a publisher in Japan wants to publish. So it got a lot of bulk sales. So her book is doing great. And I, I think, you know, she did find a company that was also, you know, really helping her get publicity because it was good for them because they make the TMS devices. So, you know, sometimes too, you can find these synergies that are really going to help. And self-publishing was a great route for her. Um, so yeah, it you know it really it's very individual based on your vision, your goals, and also are you going to be able to attract a traditional publisher? Is certainly one of those pieces. Howard, take take off to, what she said. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I want I want to go back to a point that she was making uh, about the marketing of the traditional publisher. So when the when the book um, is launched and there aren't sales and the traditional publisher says, okay, well, we're not going to invest any more time or money into this book, and it just kind of goes away. Um, the author is left to market on their own, which is which is one, one part of the equation. If you have a book uh, of your own that you've self-published and sales aren't going well, we can say, okay, well, maybe the title needs to be retitled, or maybe the cover needs to be uh, redesigned, or maybe it needs to be repositioned, or maybe we need to change the category or the description. So we have the flexibility of doing that. Uh, six months down the road, a year down the road, <laughs> yes. So she's got a beautiful example. And um, you, do you have the original? Oh, I do. Let me see if I can Okay, so let's, let's show the before and after. Um, I yeah, gotta, you, I gotta show you one too. I published, when I originally published my book, I gotta show you the cover, yeah. it's awful. Okay. And then I republished it oh. with a different cover, but go ahead. I would love yeah. to see it. So on the left there, <laughs> Um, uh, Lisa has a book that was um, published by a gentleman about three years ago or four years ago. And if you could just hold the one in your right hand closer to the screen. That was first. Um, this was the original name and cover. It was called Creating a Guide So Your Loved Ones Can Go On Living. Um, and this was the cover. And uh, the book just wasn't selling at all on Amazon uh, and in other channels. So we, we repackaged. My company repackaged the book, gave it a new title, My Family Record Book. Can you move it a little to your left? I'm oh, sorry. Yes, I'm going to try to see if I can get Hershey on Facebook, too, and let him know we are talking about his book. Yeah, that would be wonderful. But it's hard so we repackaged the book, gave it, a, gave it a, 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 a new title, a new subtitle, and an updated look, and, um, and then uh, relaunched it on Amazon. And in the first month, we sold over 500 copies oh, of the wow. book. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is phenomenal. Is, and in a, in a promotion, his book went to number one in the entire Amazon store. We had tremendous success with it. And, and not everything is like that. But, you know, there is a good example of a book that was, uh, you know, going away. Uh, as I like to say, it went to obscurity. Nobody knew it was even there. And then just by updating the cover and the title and relaunching it, we were able to have great success. With it. Howard, do you find so, when people are, are publishing that they get a little... Uh, that their ego may get in the way when it comes to what they want to title it and how they want the cover to look. I have a saying that's called, don't let the pride of authorship blind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I find that uh, most people uh, are open to a dialogue and, and a discussion. Very rarely do I run into somebody who's so set in their ideas about it. Um, and if I do, you know, they're entitled to that because that's, what you get with self-publishing, but generally people come to me or somebody like Lisa for our expertise and we're guiding them in a certain direction. So it's, it's a dialogue for sure. Yeah. You know what? I want to show you mine. I see the old one on my bookshelf, but I know darn well that the new one is downstairs. 
which means I'm going to wait four minutes for my daughter to come in the door, and then I'm going to send her on a little gopher just so okay, I could great. show you the difference. But, sure, but still sure. still holding on to the land of self-publishing. Um, and either one of you can answer this because I know, Lisa, you work with, with both. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing there's a greater increase in those that do want to self-publish? And if so, why? Yeah, I think there definitely is an increase. Um, authors even who have traditionally published and are deciding, let me do my next book, self-publishing. Um, and there are various reasons. You know, some of them um, are self-publishing because they want the control. They want to have it faster. Um, or it's a very niche market and they think, you know what, I'm going to reach this niche market on my own very easily. Don't need a publisher for that. Um, and um, so, so yeah, there are a lot of people for different reasons coming to it. Um, but, but I would say, you know, there's still a strong interest in traditional publishing because of the cachet or because, um, because of some of the things a publisher will bring to the table. And, you know, a really good team is going to bring a lot to the table. This book was originally self-published. And um, then New Harbinger saw it and picked it up. And right after they picked it up, it won a Nautilus Award while it was wow. still in the old form. But you can see what a gorgeous cover. Now, her, um, Howard will do beautiful covers too. So, but, but you know, this is a gorgeous cover. I think this team, they did have her do a bit of rewriting um, that really made it very specific for their audience. New Harbinger publishes books um, for people with eating disorders you know, for people in recovery. So they had her add some things that they knew were gonna be really great for this audience. So they know that audience so well. And that's a really good example of where the publishers bring so much to the table because this is an audience they serve and they just serve that audience. But even with a broader, you know, a broader audience like um, book like this, you know, this is published by Random House. This is Simon, Simon and Schuster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that team is bringing a lot to the table where they, um, they've worked together as a team before there's this synergy and they really know books. They've been in the industry a long, long time. So, you know, I think again, it's so individual and, you know, I, I really encourage people, if you are going to self publish, find somebody like Howard who has this kind of, um, experience in publishing. He's published a bunch of his own books done really well with them. He has these Amazon bestsellers and then he's published a lot of books for other people. So find somebody who knows that and knows all the pieces, the editing, the cover, the Amazon keywords, the Amazon marketing tools, because um, there are a lot of people out there, you know, offering you help with self-publishing, but um, but most of them don't know all the pieces. And I, I that's why I recommended Howard for this call, because he really knows all Thank these you. pieces. And, um, you know, I think it'll be great for him to talk to about some of these pieces like Amazon marketing, because there's, there's so many nuances. And Howard was telling me that, that actually self-published authors have some real um, a leg up um, compared to publishers because Amazon actually gives them some things that they don't give to publishers, which is pretty cool. Howard, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I will. And, and before I talk about that, I just want to go back to one point. So much is being said that I want to respond to. Um, thank you, Lisa. And, and I do want to say, great, Howard, thanks. after you answer, Kristen is in the house and she wants to know if it's expensive to self-publish. So a second question for you after you answer this first. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, first of all, when you publish a book, you, there's a certain e economic uh, consideration. So whether you're doing it yourself or you're doing it with a publisher. So if you're doing it with a publisher, you're gonna get approximately 10% of, um, uh, of the sale, the retail, sale of the book. So the book costs $20, you're going to make $2. So if you sold 5,000 books, you have to, you would make $10,000. Where are we going? We're going to get my book. Pretend you don't see me because I'm, I, I want to be able to you share your knowledge. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, there, there's definitely an investment needed to, uh, to create a book, but then also on the other side, you're, you're going to be making a lot more money. So on the traditional side, you're going to be making approximately $2 a book against um, whatever, uh, if your book is $20 against whatever uh, advance that you may have received. Uh, on the other side of the coin, if you self-publish, then you might be making eight or $10 a book, depending on the distribution channels. And if you sell the book yourself, 
say you're out speaking and you sell the book yourself, you might make 15 or $16 on that same $20 book. So there's a huge difference, um, both in the cost initially, um, but also on the other side. So if you have some uh, ideal uh, channels of distribution, if you think you want to be involved in marketing or open to being guided to that, then there is a greater opportunity to make money, I think, for the average entrepreneur and the average author and the traditional end. Now, to answer the question about how much you need, it could be a few thousand dollars or many thousand dollars, depending yeah. on the size of the book and what's involved with that. Uh, you know, it's fi it's, it's interesting, Howard, because when I self-published my first, I invested about five grand. And yeah. frankly, I wish I had been more educated or known a Howard or a Lisa, um, because I don't get much of a royalty on that when it's sold. And I published with Balboa Press, I don't know if you're familiar with Balboa Press. Mm -hmm. It's a sister publishing house of Hay House. And I thought, well, Hay House, yeah. I've got this yeah, self-improvement right. book. It'll be great. <laughs> um, but I have come to realize that, and this kind of goes to Kristen's, um, I'll just answer what I know, and I, I know limited compared to these two. So you can help me clarify. If I wanted to republish that book, which is this one, um, could I do it on Create Space on Amazon and save myself the three or four thousand dollars if I went with a self-publishing house. Well, you might, and the, the the big question is who owns the rights to the book. Yeah. yeah. Do you own I, the rights? Um, well, yeah, to this one. And there, this is the old cover, by the way. Isn't it horrible? Okay. You can say it's horrible. <laughs> I entered. This, I really, I really can't see it. <laughs> I entered this book in a Writer's Digest, um, like a self-publishing contest that Writer's Digest has. It's called Memoirs of Normalcy. Journey from Sedentary to Extraordinary. And um, the book is basically to help people who are working or living a mundane life to explore what they really want to do. And this was a photograph from a former college mate. And it looked beautiful on our website. I'm like, that's what I want. But when I entered it in the contest, the gentleman who judged it said, I would have chosen this book. It's fantastic writing, but the cover's horrible. Oh. So last year... Or no, a few, a few months ago, um, I had the cover redesigned, and it matches my branding. It matches my my colors and everything. Isn't that much better? Yeah, it, Howard, it's better. But uh, yeah, it's much better. But this <laughs> this book. Um, so here's a great question. This is a book that I published with Hay House. They do take the majority of the royalties. How would someone like me or someone else who wants to um, pull it out of that so they publish it themselves? How would they do that? Well, the big question is, um, do you own the rights or does Hay House own the rights? I should know the answer to that. Yeah, that's what we need to know. So if you own the rights, then you can go ahead and just pull it. And, you know, based on your contract, you have to look at your contract and look at who owns the rights. So if they do, then, you know, then the book is going to stay with them. If you do, then you could take it most likely based on your contract to go to create space. You're really going to need to take a look at what your contract says with Hay House. Yeah, yeah. So, Kristen, did that answer your question? Self-publishing, I mean, as Howard was saying, and I'm sure Lisa could add to this, there's many different options. Having said that, Howard, how do we know where to begin with these options? I've read your blogs, and you've got so much, you know, many pieces of advice, which I thought was valuable because it helped me when it came time to publish my eBooks. Right. So the, are you saying how do we know whether it's time to traditionally publish or self-publish? Is that what you're Well, asking? we're moving beyond that. Let's say we decide we're going to self-publish and there's so many different routes. I mean, I mentioned Balboa. There's Create Space on Amazon. I don't know where to begin. Where do I begin? How do I find the answer? Yeah, it could be, it could be very overwhelming. There's a lot of options. And um, I think uh, one thing that you'd want to do is, number one, speak to uh, other successful authors, other people that have self-published and find out what their experience is and what's been helpful for them, what hasn't been helpful for them. Talk to experienced people like uh, Lisa and myself who have been in the industry for a long, long time and uh, know all the ins and outs or some of the ins and outs. And, uh, and if we don't know the ins and outs, we know who to point you to so that you can have a guide along the way. And sometimes it's worthy of just uh, having that discussion with somebody like Lisa or myself and saying, okay, you know what, we want to take a, a, some time and look at what's really right for you and how to proceed. Because um, it's not always a black and white answer. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's very clear. You know, if an entrepreneur comes to me, somebody who is very marketing oriented and 
has a book about business and uh, we know that they've got great channels of distribution and all that set up and they're going to be able to do it easily, then you know, self-publishing might be a really good track for them. On the other hand, if we have somebody who comes to us who has a really great idea for a book, but you know is not business oriented and does not want to be involved in a lot of the processes necessary to produce a book, then maybe they're better off uh, trying to find an agent or, or a publishing contract. So there's no one size fits all. Um, but there are certain clues, you know, as to which way you should go. Um, uh, of course, um, you know, self-publishing and independent publishing. Sorry. Lisa, you were in so much trouble. <laughs> so sorry, that's my um, other phone. I didn't even think. Well, just to make, just to make you feel better, Lisa, I was at a wedding this weekend and um, I was sitting in the front row of the wedding and I had put my phone on airplane mode so I could take pictures and I hit a button somehow which made an eternal voice go off on the phone and it said it said you cannot access uh, the web right now you're on airplane and everybody just laughed oh, I'm glad they laughed <laughs> so i can relate to it just Kristen, so at any rate Kristen's asking a question i just want to interject real sure. quick what are the best yeah. platforms for self pub i only know of the amazon one okay so um when you say self-pub, uh, you know, I think we need to clarify some language. So publishing is a big term, you know, that that means many things. It encompasses very many aspects of getting your book to the market. So when people say uh, self-pub platforms, they're usually talking about Create Space or talking about Spark, which is Ingram's version of Create Space. And uh, these are uh, uh, platforms for you to upload your book and, and get them out into the world. So those are those are two of the the I deal with most of the time, create space um, in uh, Ingram uh, Spark, but uh, there may be others, but uh, I, I can't necessarily recommend them because uh, these two are the, the most popular and most used and with good reason. So Ingram's got tremendous distribution uh, channels and uh, uh, create space is Amazon's printing partner. And if you're going to have a book out in the world, um, you got to have it up on Amazon, or at least try having it up on Amazon to begin with. And Amazon prefers to use CrateSpace, so it is uh, it's a natural for uh, indie authors to use. How does Amazon w work as far as, um, do they assign an ISBN number? Do you need one when you publish with CrateSpace? Yeah, so you have, you have basically uh, three options uh, when you publish your book with uh, Amazon for your ISBN. You can get your own from Boker. Um, so you would be buying either one or a block of 10 initially or more um, from Boker. And then um, secondarily, you can use the Create Space. Uh, Create Space will provide you with an ISBN at no charge. And that Create Space uh, uh, imprint is going to be on your book. So it's going to say published by Create Space or by Create Space Publishing. And the third option uh, at Create Space, which I think is kind of a nice one, is that you um, you can give them ten dollars, and then they'll put the imprint in your name or in your your publishing name, whatever you choose for your publishing name, uh, or if you have a, a publishing name, you can use that. And in those two cases where you're paying the ten dollars or not paying the ten dollars and using the Create Space ISBN, they're not transferable. In other words, if you get your own ISBN and put it on the book. If you get it through Boker and put it on the book, then um, whatever you do with the book, the ISBN will follow it. If you decide to take it off of Create Space and bring it someplace else, or you want to do something else with it, then the ISBN is yours. On the other hand, if you don't do that, then you cannot take that ISBN number if you want to do something else with the book. Um, uh, so let's say you want to stop publishing on Create Space. Well, then uh, through Create Space, then if you use the Create Space ISBN or you pay ten dollars for the personalized one, then um, you're going to have to get a new ISBN anyways at that point. Uh, Lisa, I want to jump back into thank you, Howard, very much. Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to jump back into traditional publishing because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have this primary question. Sure. You know, I think they 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 watch the movies too much. We watch too much TV. And they think, you know, did you write the book first? What is the process? Do you deliver to an agent when you find one an idea? Can you walk us through like we're fifth yes. graders? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So generally, I like to start with this foundational piece of you know, what's your vision for the book? What are your goals, personal goals, professional goals, you know, um, service-oriented goals, right? What's in the world? And... Um, 
And from there, you know, who is the audience and really, really getting them, really understanding them, their pain, their needs, their wants, um, and getting clear on features, tone, what's going into the book, what is not going into the book, what is my content going to be, and then the structure. And I like to have that really clear before you even start. And then um, you're going to want a book proposal. Agents and publishers want to see a book proposal. So that's a pretty extensive document. It might be 60 pages, it might be 80. I mean, they're, you know, they're big documents and that's double space, 12 point font. But um, so a book proposal is going to have, you know, sort of this big idea about your book and the hook that really gets them excited and a sense of the market right away. And then a whole section about markets for the book. Um, you know, what is the book concept? Um, the table of contents and chapter outlines, two sample chapters of the book, uh, competitive analysis of competitive and complementary oh. books that are out there, and um, promotion plan for this book that's based on stuff you're doing, based on your platform, based on what people you're already reaching. So there's a lot that goes into um, a book proposal and you may want to write the book proposal before you write the whole book. And there are a couple reasons. So one is you you may hear back from an agent or publisher that they're really interested, but they want these changes to the book. And if you've already written the whole book, mm -hmm. then you're you know you're a little bit inefficient, right? the uh, The other um, the other thing though is it may be that you want to write the whole book. And one reason for that is that then it's a quicker time from signing a contract to actually having the book in your hands, right? They'll publish it quicker because you can hand over the book. And a great example is this book, which um, my client handed over just a few <laughs> weeks ago. And here it is. The publisher was like that. And um, I wish you could feel it. It's just this lovely, lovely book and um, Arts Awareness by Dr. Patricia Hoy. But you know, the publisher was so quick. Now, this is a smaller publisher, so they work a lot faster than, you know, the random houses of the world generally do. Um, but but if you've got the whole book written, then all of a sudden, you know, you get you you get that book contract and you can really get going faster. And one big advantage of that is in the big houses, people change all the time. You know, they change to a different shop in that company or they leave and go to a different publishing house. They get sacked. Um, and if you lose your acquisitions editor, your book is now called an orphan. And that is a terrible thing to be because there's no advocate for your book. Whoever inherits that book, they're not going to get any stars at the, in their corporation for that book doing well. So they're not going to put much into it at all. And I've seen that happen to authors. It's really sad. So if you can, you know, make a shorter window from signing to publishing, you're decreasing the likelihood of your book being orphaned. So I know it sounds kind of like a goofy thing, but you know that can be one reason to have that book ready to go quickly. And that's what you do. You help guide people through this process so they don't bang their head over and over again on the desk. <laughs> that's right. And you know, some of what we'll do is we'll talk about sort of the way publishing works and the marketing industry. And then I do a guided visualization to help people tap into their inner knowing too. Hmm. And just, you know, when Howard was talking about the self-publishing versus traditional and that it's always so customized, it's so individual based on the book and your goals and who you are. But then we also go to the inward space and sometimes we're surprised what that inner wisdom has to say about the process. And, you know, it's important to listen to that too. So, you know, sometimes we just get confirmation, yes, self-published or yes, traditionally published. And other times we sort of get the opposite of what we expected and we start to ask more questions and end up maybe doing something different from what we might have, you know, what my what I might have suggested if I just went with what I know about the industry. Yeah. Uh, Sci-fi funk is late to the party, but we all welcome with open arms anyway. And he says, I'm sorry I'm late. Do you publish via Amazon Kindle books? You know what, Sci-fi? I was just about to ask this question. Last week I did a whole blab on ebooks, but this is Howard's specialty. Um, so can you answer his question? Go for it, Howard. And feel free to yeah, ask absolutely. him questions to really round it out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, yes <laughs> is the answer. Is, yeah, when you, when you publish a book, you want to publish it in as many different formats as possible. And the, the big two right now, of course, are ebooks and, uh, and paperback and, and perhaps audiobooks too. I guess we should throw that into the mix as well. And, um, you know, any digital information can easily be converted to any other kind of digital information. 
So um, I think that uh, when you publish a book, you absolutely want to get it up on uh, Amazon as a paperback and as a Kindle book um, to start with anyways. So, so Howard, I, I stalked you a little bit um, when I was writing my eBooks and I, I wrote Was that you? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I published them in June and I happen, I'm a very driven, hungry person. And uh, again, it was Lisa's email. I'm on her email list and I saw that you had written a blog and I'm reading it. And I, you know, I'm thinking to myself in sci-fi, you might be able to relate to this. I can write an eBook. Why wouldn't I? And I had bought an eBook that was 155 um, paid marketing, you know, writing markets or something like that. And as I'm going through the information, I recognize the fact that this particular person who put this ebook together just compiled information yeah. and then made an ebook. And all of a sudden, I got yeah. really hungry for the information. So I started reading blogs. I read yours, I read Lisa's, of course, watching YouTube videos, doing um, everything I could to find more information to publish these books. But I published through Amazon Kindle. And the mm -hmm. length of my book and the subject of my book, and my books are um, how to find and create paid speaking gigs. The, the Amazon Kindle recommended I sell it for three ninety nine, and the royalty split was seventy thirty. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, can we trust Amazon Kindle with KDP, for example, when they offer these kinds of prices? And why do we just want a Kindle book versus just a paperback? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Let me answer that question first. So, and I'll direct it back to what I said earlier. The more eyeballs that you get uh, on your book, or the more eyeballs you have on the description of your book, the more books you're going to sell. Simple as that. I'm going to let um, Stephen because he has uh, Steve. I imagine you have questions and you want to just blab with us. Is that true? He says yes, Julie. Very it true. Is. Yes, I was talking it. Bring him on. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi, uh, everybody. Hello there. Hi, uh, Howard. Nice to meet you all. Likewise, did you have a specific question about uh, Kindle that we can answer for you? Well, actually, it was going to broaden out depending on how much time you want to, de to devote to <laughs> my line of questioning. Um, shall I just get it out there and then you can divert all yeah. over the place? Yeah, yeah. Sure. No. Uh, so so I, I am an author, but I've written a um, film script in 2010. Now. The world has changed, and I don't have to pursue just the film script approach. Um, and I'm interested in, um, I could convert that, to, I'm going to convert that to a comic book. I'm wow. making it as an animation. Wow. Now, it could be converted into a standard uh, novel, and therefore an e-book, therefore Amazon. And then you really interested me when you said convert it to an audio book. Discuss. Yeah, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, for, uh, two things that come to mind uh, uh, for me, for you, is number one, there's something called enhanced ebooks. Um, and you could not get it on Kindle, but you can get it on iTunes, and you'll be able to bring some video and uh, some animation into that, along with uh, different kinds of audio programs. So that could be really interesting to the creative aspect of what you do. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, a lot of people um, uh, want to publish a book first and then look for a film film right so you know if you put up a, a kindle book or a paperback and and honestly in my opinion they're both equally easy to do the only time we really want to go to kindle only is when uh, the book is really short you know if it's under 100 pages then i'd say let's do kindle only otherwise i see no reason to do or if there's color involved you know if, we, if you say a, a, a cookbook you know if you want to have color then that needs to be discussed also because you can quite get quite expensive to produce a a color book but with that being said in either case whether you put up a kindle book or a paperback or both uh, it could be the road to uh, getting somebody to pick up the film rights or to produce it for you because they see the the success that you're having with it there and it also uh, becomes real in the world it's no longer something we're just talking about but it becomes concretized it becomes real yeah yeah and 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 what about audio books then is there an auto no, there can't be an auto transcript, can there? You've got to have an actor, haven't you? Or actors? Well, it looks like you're you've got some professional soundproofing behind you there. I have. You're in my man cave here. It's a studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you know, there's a couple of options for you there. One is that you can certainly do it yourself if your voice and content match well, or you can hire somebody to do it for you. And um, you know, it's all based on uh, our hours and hours are based on number of words so we figure about 9500 words in an hour 
and that's how the audiobooks are done. So let's say you have a, a script of uh, uh, 20,000 words, you've got a two-hour audiobook approximately. And then you go out and you find a narrator and pay the narrator accordingly. And there's different levels of narrators. You can pay a couple hundred dollars for a narrator. You can pay $500 for a narrator. You can pay $1,000 for a narrator. But generally between uh, 250 and 400, you can get a, a very qualified individual to do that for you. But he's got that great accent, Howard. I know, I'm with you on that. <laughs> we dig it, Steve. You think we have an accent? No, yours is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, I, have to, I have to just point out that I speak the Queen's English. And, uh, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just sort my lighting out. I'm completely whitewashed here, aren't I? I should be back in just uh, 10 seconds. Well, it's all good, it's all good. Howard, this is a plethora of information. I had no idea that you were so fascinating. Well, thank and, you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and so, full. oh, you're much better, Steve. Now we can see your features. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I am. Not a we were worried sick. I'm not a ghost. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> uh, do you have any any other questions? Well, actually, can, uh, can I just say that, of course? Um, so I've been making this into an animation. It's not finished yet. It will be finished some of next year. Could I not just? take the whole soundtrack of the animation and call that an, an audio book. Is it that simple? No, he's shaking his no, head. No, it's not an audio book. Uh, an audio book is a book, you, you know, you're, you're talking about a soundtrack versus an audio book. Yeah, I am. So you, you, could, you could sell it as a CD. You could sell it as an audio. You could sell it as an audio download, but it wouldn't be an audio book per se uh, based on what you're telling me, I think. So, you know, without hearing it, I, I can't tell you for sure, but from the way that you're describing it, it sounds to me like it, it is a soundtrack and not a book. Could I be very bold? And if I've overstepped, I stepped back immediately. But <laughs> seeing as we're talking about me uh, for another 30 seconds, if you just click on my name and you will see a shortened URL and just play yourself 10 seconds. That's my sizzle reel. It lasts one minute, 30 seconds, and you'll get a feel for it. Jolene, I have to... Click on my name, That's and then there's a sizzle reel, and it will start playing back the animation and. Uh, hey, Rain, what? welcome. Um, just, just something that might interest you, Steve. I just gave you a website for Stage Thirty Two. Are you are you familiar with Stage Thirty Two? Stage Thirty Two is what got me on Blab. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, great. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, Stage Thirty Two for for anyone else who's interested, and welcome Rain to the party. Um, I utilize it as a playwright. And I wrote a screenplay too, just this year. Mm -hmm. um, so my next step is to hone the synopsis and the pitch. But for anybody that's in, in that realm, and, and even for authors, Lisa and Howard, I don't know if you're familiar with it all. It's just, it's an amazing group. It's a social media platform for um, creative creatives. They have yeah. authors on there. It's, yeah, it's, so, it's based around Hollywood, but they have authors on there. Yep, they have author authors. Thank you for the warm welcome, expert video coach. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. I'm glad that you're here. If you have any questions, we're talking um, publishing. We've now morphed into the land of what can we do with our creative work. Does Create Space support having links to videos in the ebook? Howard, Kristen's chiming in with that question. No, you know, you're you're. They support the links only so much as that they're in the printed form. So, you know, whatever your printed form is, it, it's, it's right. a book. You know, it's there's nothing you, you're not going to be able to put your cursor over it and make anything happen. You know, in the digital uh, form, in the Kindle form, yes, uh, absolutely. But um, in paperback form, you no. know what, Kristen? And that's what Crate, crate Space um, does. I did a, a blab a few weeks ago and I had a woman by the name of um, Tamara Monsaroff on and she wanted to make her book interactive a page turner and she used oh god what are those called um those square they're almost like oh, a, yeah um uh yeah they, like the the VR code or they, they put your phone over yeah I can't so Kristen, she actually like if there was something in the book where she wanted to have interact you saw that blab ah she got the idea high five to you Kristen. high five good 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 so go back and and find that it's on my my website Go back and find that and listen again and maybe um, QR code. Do you mean the QR, QR code? code? Yes. Hi, Ron. Welcome. Yeah, the QR code. So that's how she made her um, soft cover or hard cover book clickable, that the links were clickable. So Brilliant. thank you. Welcome, Ron. We're talking we're talking um, 
traditional publishing versus self-publishing. And now we have Steve down in the bottom right corner because this guy just fascinates me. He writes a, a script and now he's talking audio and how he can monetize it and how Amazon might be able to support that. So um, if you have any questions regarding self or regarding traditional, we've got about nine minutes left. Spit them out. I mean, this is your chance. We've got two incredibly talented professionals, experts here between Lisa and Howard that have been able to answer our questions regarding publishing, whether it be self-publishing or traditional. So um, feel free, Ron, if you have any questions. Um, Steve, do you have any more as far as where you were going? No, I think I think we're good. I think I should hop off because we've had some new people join and see if they want to ask questions on air. Well, thank you so much for, nice for stopping in. It was nice to see you. Nice Stay with us for the next seven minutes. Yeah. So this is actually, I am, this has been great. I know that it has educated me and my purpose with Speaker Pro is to do that with the people in the speaker community and, and within the entrepreneurial community. So I have a question now I'm gonna throw out there until someone else pops one in. Um, I'm a speaker and I had mentioned in the beginning that I wrote and published my book. So in the back of the room, I would look like this, this expert. Can either one of you speak to the fact, would you say the stigma of self-publishing is faded to almost nil at this point. It's definitely faded, um, you know, and, and that's, I think, partly, I mean, you see so many well-known authors who are self-publishing. So mm -hmm. um, Eric Qualman has self-published, you know, I'm just throwing a few out, and I think um, Stephen King, right, and, and uh, Tim, Fer Tim Ferriss, well, Tim yep. Ferriss went with Amazon, it wasn't self-published, but um, yeah, a lot of people are self-publishing. Um, so yeah, I would I would say there's not a, a stigma in that sense, but but there is this issue that there's so much junk out there, you know, that it's not well edited, the cover is crummy. So you know, it is your job to do something great, you know, and and have a wonderful editor, um, have a great designer, the kinds of things that Howard does. I know I keep. Like Howard, but he does such a great job, and he's done it for my clients. So. <laughs> okay, but you know it is so so critical, and um, and and so you know don't put junk out there because that's the stigma. Somebody sees a crummy yeah. cover, and that's the stigma right there. You have a gorgeous cover, people aren't going to really, you know, immediately you make an impression and a positive one. So it's it's really about um, it's much more. I think um, it's in your hands now. And if you have a gorgeous cover and a great title, and um, right away somebody is going to think highly of your book, and then if they open it, it's full of spelling errors. You know, forget it. You lose mm -hmm. credibility. So uh, the, I would say that. What would you, what would you say, Howard? Well, I, I just completely agree uh, with what you had to say. Uh, I don't think the stigma that is there anymore. And uh, it is only there when your book isn't been published properly or when you haven't taken the care with it that, that Lisa mentioned, you know, having the design done properly, both inside and outside of the book, that the editing hasn't been done or hasn't been done properly. Um, you know, it just it starts to reek of what we would call, you know, the old self-publishing world. But mm -hmm. today, so many people are self-publishing and doing it right that, you know, <clears throat> I've got tons of books here. You couldn't tell between this and any quote unquote traditional published book. There is no difference. The only difference is in what happened behind the scenes to get I it there. That. But on the outside, it, it looks very much the and same. And then in rare occasions. I just yeah. want to and on rare, uh, on rare occasion, it, it is uh, helpful to say, you know, that I've been published by, you know, this publishing company or that publishing company. On rare occasion, for most of us, not so yeah. much, you know. You know, you mentioned the copy editing. And interestingly, I was at a conference a few weeks ago and a woman, I mean, I'm not a super author. I'm a self-published author. And she knew that I had self-published. And she was asking me all sorts of questions. How did you get started? Where did blah, blah, blah. And I said to her, I was giving her tips and I said, and then you want to make sure you find someone that's, that's, um, that can copy edit it for you. And she just kind of looked at me. I said, copy edit is where they go through. And she goes, I know what it is, but I don't need to do it because I'm the author. And I said, well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was trying to, you know, I felt myself get triggered by this. And I said, well, that's exactly why you should have it copy edited because you want I mean, you, you know, you, I had to, I had two, two sets of eyes look at mine and I, there's still a couple of errors that just drive me crazy, but we yeah. find errors in, in any yeah. book. Um, but I said to her, that's exactly why, because you've read it and written it so much, you're glazing right over some mistakes. And she got so insulted. And you know, wow. 
It's interesting because I will often, at the final stage, if I've been editing a book for a long time, in the final stage, I'll say hire a proofreader because I'm not going to see the errors because my my mind's going to fix it. I'm too close to it. So, you know, if if I've been editing a book, I will say hire a proofreader for that last phase um, if it's a self-published book. Absolutely. I like I like to tell authors that even the editors need yeah. editors. Oh yeah. And so I, I was foolish enough on a couple books Uh-oh. my early early on, you know, to write to write books that where I was the author, and because I was a writer, I knew that I could find the mistakes. Well, you know, I was definitely wrong about that, and uh, you know, even the editors need editors. Everybody needs to have their work at least proofread, because uh, it's impossible to catch all the mistakes. And there isn't a book out there, as you're starting to say, that doesn't have a mistake. Yeah. In it. It's just the nature. Of I the get books. excited personally when I see it, like a you know, a well-known author. I'm like, aha, aha. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you see too many, it really turns you off, right? I mean, it takes you out of the book. The person loses credibility. It's like yeah. it's nice if there's one or two, but that's it. Yeah. Um, Ron says, as an audiobook narrator, we end up becoming editors to some extent. Yeah. Uh, that's that's great. Sci-fi has another question, and this this range of sci-fi. He says, how much do copy editors charge for, say, a screen? play length work. I know some do it by the page. It could be between 25 and 40 bucks. What what to, what can you two offer? For uh, what kind of, for a screenplay? Screenplay length work. And that could be between 90 uh, and 120 pages for a screenplay. Yeah, I think it's going to vary uh, depending on the, the level of what kind of edit is needed and, um, you know, who you're going to. So I, I think it could be across the board, but maybe at least you have more. Yeah, I, it does vary so much. I mean, mm-hmm. really extreme. Some people, you know, you're going to see like $3 a page. Some will be $25 a page. Um, so it, it's very hard to say. But what I would say is there are different types of editing too, which, you know, we haven't said much about. But, you know, there's developmental editing in the beginning about what should really be in the book, what shouldn't, where should it go. And then there's... Um, you know, that other level of editing where you're editing line by line, um, copy editing, and then there's proofreading, which is really mm-hmm. just at the very end, making sure there are no typos. And again, that should be a fresh set of eyes from the other editor. So there, there are different types of editing too that I think people should be aware of um, because they point. all serve a purpose. And, you know, if you wait till the end and try to do it all in one, you're gonna miss things and, um, and miss opportunities as well as errors. Sounds expensive. Well, you know, <laughs> it, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> you know what? I, I think of it as first of all, you know, you want to have a business plan with your book, right? And that book should be doing something for your business. It's not just about the book sales, but if if you're a speaker and that book is increasing your opportunities and you're getting higher paid gigs, then that book is more than paying for itself. You know, and the other piece is some of this is like getting a degree. You know, it's really an education. And um, so if you don't have a business plan, it may not be worth the money. I mean, you've really got to have a business plan. And, and I and I really stress that with all my clients is, you know, how are you going to make money with this book? Not just book sales. Like, what are the other ways? Because that's absolutely critical to, right. to make it worth Yeah, I think it. Can I say one more thing before, before we throw you off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's been said that the money in publishing is not in the books, you know, as Lisa was alluding to. So if you get if you have a book, it opens the door to speaking engagements. So there's some speaking engagements you can't get unless you have a book. If you have a book, and let's say you spent five thousand dollars to do your book or ten thousand dollars to do your book, and you're getting a, a, a number of speaking engagements because of it, then it, it more than makes uh, up for the money that you spent. If you're investing ten thousand dollars and you have no marketing plan and no marketing funnel and no place to take that book then, and by that I mean to other products and services, then you may want to rethink spending that $10,000. But if that $10,000 can turn into $100,000 or $200,000 because that book has opened up doors and created uh, people coming into your world that want your other services, then it's well worth it. Beautiful. Well, I thank you guys so very much. Do me a favor, yeah, off to the pleasure. right, again, your emails and your web addresses. If anybody that has popped in here today is interested in learning more from Howard or from Lisa, I wouldn't recommend them, honestly, if I didn't think they had any kind of clout whatsoever. These are two extreme experts, and I'm personally very humbled that they gave me the time to be on Speaker Pro Lab today. So 
um, free mini course on book writing. Great stuff. Thank you. Yay. Thanks for joining us, Kristen. Thank you, Charlie. And I'll see you guys next week on Speaker Pro. Let me just tell you what the subject is. I was supposed to check this beforehand and I didn't. It's every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And next week we are we are to ooh, online courses. That's what we're talking about. Online courses for speakers. So if anyone out there wants to learn more about online courses, how they can monetize from them, how they can repurpose content to generate cash, that's what we'll be doing next week. So thanks, Ron. Come visit us again. Thank you, everybody, so, so very much. Visit Lisa, visit Howard, and visit me. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye.